so much and dance in his presence prior to the sermon is because God instructed us that when we come before him, we must enter his cause with thanksgiving and praises. And we know that right now, having fulfilled our requirements, the spirit of the Lord is present with us because we have entered with praises and thanksgiving and he is here, right here with you and I. And we give him all the glory of God. And today, our first reading is taken from the book of Psalms, Psalm 103, the whole chapter. Psalm 103. Now, we know this is the last day of the year, and it's a time for you and I to reflect and look over what has happened to us over the past 365 days. It's a time of reflection and a time of planning for the future. And so this psalm is very relevant because it reveals the benefits that God has given to you and I. I know many of us will rather focus on the negative things that have occurred to us. But let me just tell you that if you are alive and able to breathe and walk and see and eat today, you are better than millions of people that perished this year. Who are no longer with us. You recall that in Turkey earlier this year there was an earthquake that lasted 46 seconds, and in 46 seconds, 46,000 people perished. Under a minute, 46,000 human beings died. This is not to talk of the other calamities that have gone on around us. So it doesn't matter what happened to you. It doesn't matter the negative things that have occurred in your life this year. The fact that you are here now, that life is enough to give God glory. The Bible says that a living dog is better than a dead lion. So you and I are here because God has allowed us to be here to witness this day in his presence and to give glory to him. And so he starts by saying, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. It's an instruction. It doesn't matter what you've gone through this year. You have been instructed to bless the Lord. And all that is within you, everything, your spirit, soul, body, is to bless his holy name. How can you bless the Lord? Isn't the Lord supposed to bless you and I? Isn't that what we pray constantly for? But well, here, King David is telling you and I to bless the Lord. Why? Because of his goodness to us. Now, how can you, a human being, bless the Lord? Now, it's not talking of material blessings, obviously. He's talking of giving praise to him, adoring him, worshipping him, living a holy life unto him. That's what it's referring to. That's how you bless the Lord. In every day, every minute of the day, you can either bless or not bless God by the way of life that you follow. So it says, bless the Lord. means give him glory. Give him honor. Due to him. Give him the honor due to him because he's God. 
See, you don't only bless God when everything is going well with you. No. You bless God all the time because it's God. The Bible says that all these work are good for good to those that love God and that are called according to his purpose. So, in your life, you have positive things and you have negative things. That is normal. Imagine an electrical cord and you just put the positive wire there. It's never going to work. Right? You could have the positive and the negative connected and the power is released. Without the negative, the positive would never work. So life is made of positive and negative things. And I know many of you are reflecting on what has happened this year and you're saying, I am saying, oh, I wish that had never happened. That needs to happen for you to be alive at this hour. If the negative things did not happen to you, most likely you will not be here today. Let me just tell you right there, in case you don't understand it. You need the negative things in your life for completion and continuity. It says, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Everything you have, you must use to bless God and praise him and worship him. Why? Because he's a good God, because of his goodness and his mercy to you and I. The fact that you are alive today is enough to bless his holy name. As you may know that else happened to you this year, the fact that you he kept you alive is enough reason. Now he keeps on telling us all his benefits. He said, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. We human beings tend to focus on the negative things. We ignore the positive things. He says, who forget not all his benefits. There's so many things, so many benefits that God has granted to you this year. Remember that song, count your many blessings and see what God has done. We focus on negative things. I recall a time when I was going through a very difficult in my life, I just sat down, I began to think, I began to mourn, I began to sorrowful. Then suddenly, this song just sprung in my heart. It says, Count your blessings in the one by one. Count your blessings in what God has done. Count your blessings. See, you need to count your blessings. When you begin to count quickly, all those negative thoughts will dissipate and disappear. So who redeems? First of all, it says, who forgives all your iniquities? Only God can cancel your iniquities. First Timothy 6:16. Who forgives all your iniquities? That's the first thing he mentions. Because your sins are what can send you to hell. And if you have a God that can forgive them and cancel them, that's the greatest benefit. What's the point of you having all the money when you end up in hellfire? First Timothy 6 16. Quickly. Yes. Uh huh. That's it. Amen. See, who forgives all your iniquities? Hmm. And who heals all your diseases? Ezra 9, verse 13. Sorry. Uh, ex- Jeremiah 17, 14. Jeremiah 17, 14. And read Isaiah 33, 24. Isaiah 34, Jeremiah 17, 14, Exodus 15, 26. Go on here. Jeremiah 17, 14. Yes. Oh Lord, if you heal me, I will truly be healed. Mm-hmm. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. Mm-hmm. yes. If you save me, I will truly be saved. Mm-hmm. My praises are for you, alone. That's it. And uh, Isaiah 33, 24. Oh. Mm-hmm. He is the one that healed you 
when they sent an arrow of sickness to kill you, he didn't allow you to die. He's the one that canceled all your iniquities. Go the work he did on the cross. He paid the penalty for your sins. Isaiah 33, 24, quickly. Somebody? Isaiah 34, yes. And the inhabitant shall not say, I am sick. Mm-hmm. The people that dwell there shall be forgiven their iniquities. That is it. Only Jesus can save. Only he can cancel and forgive your iniquities. And if your iniquities are forgiven, then you're free to go and continue in your life. But if your iniquities are not forgiven, then they will be held against you. And if you happen to die in that state, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. You will not be able to do that. So who redeems your life from destruction? Who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies? He is saying all these things to remind us of what Jesus our Lord has done, is doing, and will do for us. He redeems our life. What does that mean? To redeem somebody means to buy them back from destruction. What kind of destruction? Death. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. And without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. So, Jesus Christ redeemed yeah. us from the destruction that you and I were due for because of our sinfulness. We had all sinned against God and we had a death sentence on all of us. But he said, I will go and pay the price. I will die the death that brother so so and so should have died. I will take the pain and agony that you should have received let him go. That's what Jesus did for you and I. He redeemed us. He brought us out of the destruction of our sins. And he crowned us with loving kindness and tender mercies. So who satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Do you understand what happens to the eagles? Why the eagle, even if it's 40 years, still looks very young? Because that eagle, when it gets to a certain age, it stands on a high mountain and begins to pluck the hairs on his body, one by one. He plucks them out and it stays there until the new hair goes out. When the new hair goes out, he leaves and continues his lifespan. So it's constantly renewed. So it says God will renew your youth like that. You will not grow old because he will renew your strength. That is the power of God. How? Through satisfying you with good things. That means blessings. Your skin will begin to shine. You begin to look young. You will wonder how old is this person? How old is that person? Because God is renewed. The Bible says that Moses, even at the age of 120, remained strong. Said his eyes were clear and his speech was not sick. He was not sick. I think in 120 he was still as strong because God renewed him. Because he was constantly in God's presence, the Spirit of God renewed him. So you too can be renewed like that. And unfortunately, you see some people, even though they're still very young, they look so old, they're decrepit. Why? Because they're apart from God and sickness, all kinds of things have destroyed their bodies. For you and I, that should not be our own option. No, because God will renew us. And renew our strength, satisfies our mouth, our mouth with good things, so that our youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord executes the righteousness and judgment for all that are oppressed. So if you are oppressed in your place of work, in your family, wherever you may be oppressed, know that God will execute righteousness and judgment for you. In other words, you don't have to feel sorrowful and sad. And it, no. Know that God is fighting for you. In that your pressure, he will lead you out. Don't give up. God is your defender. He made known his ways unto Moses, his acts to the children of Israel. Why is he saying this? Which one is, is better? To know God and his ways, or to know his acts. 
Many of you want to see miracles and things like that happen. But if you don't know the God of the miracles, you will be at a great loss. See, God revealed himself to Moses. Moses knew God intimately. So he will not do things that would offend him. So the people of Israel, they knew God's acts, how he divided the Red Sea, how he rained manna from heaven, how the water came from the rock, and all these things they saw. So despite that, what happened to them? Once they crossed the Red Sea, they went straight to idolatry. So, seeing the acts of God cannot change you. No, 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 no. You can see all the miracles from God. In fact, the children of Israel saw God's visible manifestation, yet they turned against Him. I'm telling you, in this coming year, seek to know God more intimately. Then you will not run foul of Him in any way. It's better to know God like that. That we know his acts and begin to look for miracles. No. In any case, miracles, the Bible says, are unbelievers. For a child of God, a miracle is supposed to be part of your life. It's to be a regular occurrence. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and plenteous in mercy. In all these things, he's saying all this to remind you as you go into the new year, the God that you serve is a merciful God, is gracious. Slow to anger and plenteous in mercy. The Bible says that if not for the Lord's mercies, you and I would have been destroyed. So you might be complaining now, but at the same time, remember that God's mercy is what has brought you so far. Numbers 14 18, Deuteronomy 5 10. Numbers 14 18, Deuteronomy 5 10. And Lamentations 3 22. Yes. The Lord, the Lord is slow to anger and mm-hmm. is unfailing love, mm-hmm. forgiving every kind of sin and rebellion. That says. But he does not excuse the guilty. He mm-hmm. takes the sins of the parents upon their children. Yes. The entire family is affected, even the children in the third and fourth generation. Thank you. I always remember that. Go on. Deuteronomy 5 10. Then Jesus 3 22. Deuteronomy 5 10. Yes. Uh huh. That's it. So, if you want God's mercy in this coming year, make sure you abide by His commandments. Because His word says He shows mercy to those that follow His commandments. When Satan comes to ask for your blood, God will remember your obedience and save your life. Lamentations 3 22. Quickly, I mentioned three twenty two. Hmm? So it's uh, yes. It is the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed, because His compassions fail not. I mentioned three twenty two. They are new every morning. Great is Thy faithfulness. The mercy of yesterday may not be enough for today. Every day you need to go to God and get a renewal of His mercies on your life. Because what you may face today, there could be different world you faced yesterday. So you need a renewal of God's mercies every day of your life. Don't be content with what happened yesterday and say, Oh, I thank the Lord yesterday. So, so, so. Today is a new day with His own problems. And you need another level of mercy, a refreshment. Of God's mercies in your life. So he will not always chide, neither will he keep his anger forever. <laughs> Isn't that beautiful to thank God for that? Remember all the bad things you've done, especially this year, and God does not destroy you. Why? Because he does not keep his anger forever. Whereas most of us, we keep anger, malice, all these things. We thank God that it's not like us. Because if it's like us, many of us will not be where we are today. But he doesn't keep his anger. His anger is only for a moment. Isaiah 57 verse 16. Isaiah 57 verse 16. He will not always chide. He will not always correct. 
and he does not keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. Look on your own life. Go on, yes, please. Isaiah 7, 16. Yes. So I will not fight against you forever. Uh huh. Mm-hmm. That is it. That is it. If God was angry with us, none of us can survive. We thank God that his anger is only for the moment. So we may endure for the night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. Ezra 9 13. God has not dealt with you according to your sins. If God was not a forgiving God, all of us are destined. But we thank God for his forgiveness. The Bible says once and uh, one, one thirty that God is a God that forgives. So read it as Ezra nine thirteen. Anybody this time? And I thou heard that it's come upon us for yes. our evil deeds, for uh-huh. our great trespass. Yes. Seeing that thou our God has punished us less uh-huh. than our iniquities deserve. Yes. And giving us such deliverance as such. That is it. See? He has punished us less than our iniquities desired. You know, uh, this is God's grace. That's the mercy of our lives. For as the heavens high above the earth, so great is his mercy towards them that fear him. This note. So great is his mercy towards them that fear him. As the heavens are high above the earth. That means that really, if you fear God, the mercy of God on your life, they are boundless. There's no limits. You know, that's why we have this sand on the national land because you cannot count the most sand that goes. Saying that this God you're serving, His mercies on you are endless. So always pray for God's mercies. Remember Black Bartimaeus when Jesus was passing by and He said, Son of David, have mercy upon me. Mercy means something you don't deserve has given to you. All of us. Need God's mercy because none of us is worthy of God's grace or blessings. You can't say, Oh, God should bless me because I'm so, 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 and so, because I do this. No. None of us can meet God's standards. It is only by His grace and His mercy that we're here. So it's as high as the heavens above, they are so great. It's His mercy towards them that fear Him. So if you fear God, what is the, what's the fear of God? Fear of God is obey his commandments. The beginning of wisdom, that's what the Bible says. If you fear God, you will obey his commandments and the door of mercy will be open to you. So this coming year, let that be your watchword that you will obey God in all his commandments so that his mercy door will be forever opened unto you and your family. It was God's mercy on Noah that saved his family. You know, Noah was found righteous in the whole world. But because of God's mercy, he was asked to build an ark for his family. His whole family was included in that ark. That was a sign of God's mercy. As far as the east from the west, so far have they removed our transgressions from us. God has removed the transgressions as far as the you know you cannot bring the east to the west. It's impossible. It's too far. So meaning that if you come to God, the God you and I serve, He will remove the transgressions so that you cannot even bring it back. The Bible says He throws it in the sea of forgetfulness. God Himself cannot recall, but we human beings, oh, <laughs> before you say to and to say, we remind you quickly of what you've done for them. That's not the God of the Messiah. Isaiah 43, 25, Ephesians 1, 17. Ephesians 1, 17. Isaiah 43, 25. Isaiah 43, 25. Quickly, Ephesians 1, 17. Isaiah 43, 25. Yes. I, yes, I alone will blot out all your sins. Aha. Uh-huh. That's it. That is it. God says, I will not remember your sins. So whenever anybody begins to remind you of your iniquities, tell them that even God, my creator, promised not to remember my sins. So who are you to keep on reminding me? 
when the Creator said you will not remember them anymore. He removes your transgressions as far as the east from the west. Like as a father pities his children, so the Lord pities them that fear him. Let's see that word again. So all God's blessings and mercy and kindness, they are really for those that fear him, meaning those that obey his commandments. So if you want to get that God's favor, God's mercy, begin to obey him. And all those numerous blessings will be open to you. Isaiah 63, verses 15 and 16. Isaiah 63, 15 and 16. Malachi 3, 17. Yes. 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 God looked down from heaven yes. from your holy glorious home and see us. Mm-hmm. Where is his passion and the might he used to show on our behalf? Mm-hmm. Where are the mercies and compassion now? That's Surely it. you are still our father. Yes. If Abraham and Jacob were his own ones, mm-hmm. you are still our father. That is it. You are our redeemer from Abraham. Amen. What a wonderful verse. Malachi 3 17. On the day when I act, yes. says the Lord Almighty. Mm-hmm. They will be my treasured possession. Yes. I will spare them. Yes. John of the Father has compassion. Mm-hmm. Spare the son. That is it. Says, if God is a father, then God will spare you. Just like a, an earthly father will spare his children. You are God's children, right? He's not going to just destroy his children. No father does that. He has mercy on you, he forgives your iniquities, and all this. The same thing we do, God does to us. He says, like as his father pities his children, so the Lord pities them that fear him. For he knows our frame, he measures them in dust. See, God knows that we human beings are weak. As for man, his days are as grass, as the flower of the field. So he flourishes, for the wind passes over it, and it's gone. And the place thereof shall know it no more. In other words, man is temporary. All these people bring all these things around. They forget that one day they will leave this earth. So all this grand, grand boasting and doing is pointless. Everyone on this earth must die one day, right? So whatever you're going to do, do what will last after you're gone. Not temporary things. Remember that one day you and I will leave this earth. So what would happen after you leave this earth? That's what you think of whatever you act. So for the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him and his righteousness unto their children and children. So if you live a godly life, you are procuring or preparing God's blessings for your generations long after you're gone. But if you live a terrible life, the same thing as we had, that he will require the sins of the fathers of the third generation. Many people today are suffering, especially in Africa, because of the iniquities of their generations. What their fathers and grand grandfathers have done, they are paying the price today. And they're wondering why. I do this, I do that, but it seems to be no way. Well, you need to go to your roots. Ask God, what sin are my generations committing? Lord, show them to me so that I can repent of them. A good example in the Bible. In the time of King David's reign, there was a famine in the land, and thousands had died. After some time, David said, I, mean, I couldn't find the reason for this famine. And then he went to God. He said, God, why do we have this famine in the land? And God said, It's because of the sin of Saul. Saul had died a long time before then. And the people of Israel were not paying the price of what he did when it was. Apparently, Saul, when he was alive, he destroyed the Gibeonites after making a promise not to destroy them. He went and destroyed them. And God said, You broke your promise. And the children are going to suffer that. And you know what they did? They gathered the descendants of Saul, seven of them, and killed them. And the famine stopped. Many of you are suffering. The consequences of what your great great grandfathers have done. And you don't know why. But you go to God. God, what sin have my progenitors committed against you? Tell me that I can repent of them. That's the only thing I'm saying. You can go anywhere you want, not going to be cheap until you break that curse upon your life. 
for the wind passes over it, but the mercy of the Lord from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him, to such as keep his covenants, and to those that remember his commandments to do them. You can see the emphasis on keeping God's covenants, on obeying him. That should be your watchword for this coming year. Lord, give me your spirit to remember your commandments, to do them, not just to hear. That in this 2024, I will be a doer of your word rather than a hearer. It's very easy to come to church and hear sermons every day. But how many actually live the kind of life they hear about in those sermons? Deuteronomy 7, verse 9. Deuteronomy 7, verse 9. See, his mercy is from everlasting to everlasting to those that fear him. And his righteousness comes to their children's children. Understand therefore. Yes. That the Lord your God is a good God. Yes. He is a faithful God who keeps his covenant mm-hmm. for a thousand generations. Mm-hmm. And lavishes his unfailing love on those who love him. That's it. And obey his command. That is it. But the devil deceives you and I to violate God's commandments because he doesn't want God's blessings to come upon us. This is why he deceived Eve. In the garden of Eden, we God Himself built. He saw the blessings that are going to come to human beings. He said, Ah, these people kind of allow them to enjoy these blessings. Well, how am I going to get rid of them? I'm going to entice them to sin against God. Satan had no power to expel Eve from the garden. No. But when he made Eve to sin, he knew the penalty. And so he walks indirectly by enticing you, tempting you to sin. He knows that you want to sin, you will suffer the consequences. So we have to resist, the Bible says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. He will flee from you. The Lord has prepared his throne in the heavens as kingdom rules over all. But the Lord, bless the Lord his angels that excel in strength, that do his commandments, hearken to the voice of his word. Bless ye the Lord, all ye his hosts, ye ministers of his that do his pleasure. Bless the Lord, all his works in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. So it's emphasizing and telling us again, you and I need to constantly bless the Lord. Even the angels are commanded to bless the Lord. His host, his ministers, Daniel 7 verse 9, bless the Lord. You can bless the Lord every day of your life. You wake up, you bless him in praise and worship. You raise him up, say, Lord, I bless you. Now, Bless you, I give you praise, you're worthy of my praises, all you deserve my praises. You know, that's you adore him, you know, I every day of your life. Yes. I the tombs. Yes. Are cast down. Mm-hmm. And the ancient of days did sleep. Uh-huh. Those garments were white as snow. Yes. And the air of the air was like pure wool. Mm-hmm. His throne was like the fair flame. Yes. And his wheels are burning fast. That's it. So the your watchword for this coming year, two points. One, remember to bless the Lord constantly. And two, remember to keep his commandments. Now, he's saying that you need the help of the Holy Spirit to keep God's commandments because Satan will constantly tempt you to disobey God. You'll find everybody around you doing the same thing. And the whisper you hear, how come you think you're special? Are you the only one going to heaven? Say, all of us are going to heaven. It's a lie. He says, go to hell. But he deceives you. He says, oh, everybody's doing the same thing. Everybody's fornicating, doing all these bad things, drug trafficking, fraud. You know, what's so special about you? Well, that's a lie from the pit of hell. You can be the only person in your family that will follow God. God can sentence the whole act as he did in the time of Noah. He destroyed the whole earth, except for Noah and his family. So don't say, oh, some people say, if God's going to destroy everybody, then all of us are going to be destroyed. Yes, he can do it. He's already done it. Hello, what is new? If you're the only one in your place of war that will maintain righteousness, don't change. Because when the destruction comes, at the time of Noah, everybody will be swept away except you. Even though they can laugh at you, call you names, mock you. Yes, that's fine. When the judgment comes and you are sick in the ark and they are washed away, 
you know, many of the people, many of Noah's relatives would have knocked on the door of that ark when the flood came. Oh. Said, Noah, Noah, don't you remember my uncle? We used to eat together. Since the blades. So it never been sets. May that not be our portion as we enter this new year. The second passage in the book of Luke, chapter 17, we see Jesus going to Jerusalem and he passed through Samaria and Galilee. Samaria was a place for people that were not Jews, they were mixed breeds, and they hated the Jews, and the Jews hated them as well. So he passed through this place in Galilee, and as he entered a certain village, they met him ten men that were lepers, which stood far off. There are two things there. Lepers are not allowed, even in Nigeria and other places, to live in the city because of the disease they carry. It was very highly infectious. So they're giving a leper colony to live outside the towns, right? So Jesus was about to enter the town and he saw these lepers. Apparently, he had passed through where they were given to live. And these lepers came to him. Well, they stood power because no lepers are allowed to come near a normal human being. They're supposed to announce that coming that, you know, unclean, unclean. Leviticus 13, 46 and Numbers 5, verse 2. So Jesus met them as he was entering the city because that's where they lived. And they couldn't come near him because of their leprosy. Maybe you have a leprosy in your life today. And Jesus is passing by. What are you going to do about it? Go on. Numbers 5, verse 2. Leviticus 13, 46. Leviticus 46. Mm-hmm. They must live in isolation in their place outside the town. Yes, and numbers 5 is 2. Yes. Yes. So they were separated. That's why they couldn't come near Jesus. And many people today feel like those lepers. They feel so unclean. They feel they cannot come to God, they cannot come to church. They say, if only you knew what I've done, you would understand why I can't come to church. But that's a lie from the pit of hell. But I'm telling you that even where you are, it may be in your house. You can still call on Jesus today as he's passing by. As you hear this message, Jesus is speaking to you and calling you. He says, come unto me, all you that live on heavy lady, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. And gentle and humble in heart and find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my body is light. If you're hearing me today and you're in that position, you think you're a leper. You think you're so unclean. You think you can't come to Jesus. I'm telling you today, he's calling you. He's passing by. He's asking you to come. And says they stood far off, and they lifted with their voices because they, they couldn't come near Jesus. I mean, they were lepers, and said, "Jesus, Master, have mercy on us." Oh. See that word again, mercy. Have mercy on us. Really, this should be the most important thing to pray for that coming year. Because why? Why didn't they say, "Jesus, heal us"? They knew they were lepers. They suffered. Disease of leprosy. Why don't they say Jesus heal us of our leprosy? No. They say, have mercy on us. Just like that continues. By asking for God's mercy, you are not restricting God as to what He can do for you. They're saying, God, wherever there's a shortcoming in my life, come and heal. Let it be according to your decision, not my own will, but your will. Jesus Master, because they had heard about him, that this man is a miracle worker. I said, eh? He's passing by? You mean that is Jesus, the one that's making the lame to walk, the, the deaf to hear, the blind to see, the dead to read? That's him? Well, let's go. What are we waiting for? I have nothing to lose. In any case, nobody is going to entertain us. We can't go into the town. If we miss this opportunity, well, that's it. We 
it was a miracle worker, you better go now. And that is a message to many people today. This may be your last opportunity to hear this message of salvation. You may not hear this again. So why don't you seize the opportunity right now as it's passing you by, as it's speaking to you. Don't wait any longer. You might not pass that way anymore. He said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Have mercy on us. That was grant us in your own estimation, what you think we need. They didn't say, Jesus, heal us of your lep- our lepers. No. Say, we are lepers. You know we are lepers. If you want to heal us, fine. If there's anything else, grant it to us. But we are asking for your mercy. We know we don't deserve anything. Now, they would have said, oh, this leper is, I don't know how I got it. This woman gave it to me. Or that man gave it to me. I had nothing to do with it. He didn't say that. No human being can stand on anything before God. You and I need God's mercy every day. So have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said unto them, Go show yourselves unto the priests. Why did Jesus say that? He didn't heal them of the leprosy. He didn't say, uh, cast away leprosy from them. He said, Go show yourself to the priests. Leviticus 13, verse 2. Matthew 8, 4. Why would a leper go show himself to the priests? What? Read it. Yes. If anyone has this body or a rash or this colored skin, yes. That person must be brought to the area of the priest. Yes. That's it. So the priests were like the physicians that certified people who were healed. You know, in other words, if somebody had leprosy, they couldn't come into the town. Or until they had seen the priest, the priest had examined them, made sure they were healed, and then certified them to enter the town. If they enter the town without the priest certification, they will be bound up again or even killed. So that's why Jesus said, Go show yourself the priest. Meaning that by the time you get there, you would have been healed of this leprosy, and he will satisfy you, and you can go back to the village. That's what Jesus meant that. Go show yourself. He didn't have to tell them you are healed. No. Because he knew that by going to the priest, you are seeing that priest, I've healed of my leprosy, let me go back home. See? Jesus said, go show yourself the priest. And it came to pass that they went, they were cleansed. That was exactly what they wanted. Jesus healed them to prepare them for the certification by the priest to allow them to return home. Now, one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back and with a loud voice glorified God. Job 39 30. Are you glorifying God today for your life? That he has kept you for 365 days. He has healed you. He has forgiven you. Are you glorifying God? Gone? Yes. Job 39 Yes. And no one all the top of the earth. Mm-hmm. Where the sleep are, there she is. Okay, Psalm 103, verse 1. That's, we just read that, actually. Yeah. Bless the Lord, O my soul. So, this man came back, having confirmed that he was healed. Now, there were ten of them that received the healing and fell down on his face at his feet, that he just be giving him thanks. And remember, I said he was a Samaritan. He was not a Jew, he was a Samaritan. In other words, this man was a foreigner. The other people might have been Jewish, but they never came back to glorify God. He was the only one that came. And Jesus answered and said, Were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? See? Where are the nine? That's what Jesus is asking you today. All the things he's done for you in this year, have you come back to give him glory and thanks? As I said, even if he does not do anything for you, the fact that you are alive at this hour is enough to glorify, to bless him. Hmm? Look around you. How many of your colleagues are no longer here? How many have perished in your family, in your place of work? But you have been preserved. You are in his presence. You are alive. You can eat, you can drink, you can walk, you can see, you can hear. 
I have many that can't do any of those things that you're taking for granted. Many in the hospitals right now as so we speak. Many step last night I didn't wake up this morning. None of that happens to you. Therefore, you should glorify him. You should give him thanks. Like that Samaritan. The reason why he put there that this man was a Samaritan because the people that he expected to come back, his own people, the Jews, did not come back. What I'm trying to tell you, the people of God who are supposed to know better are the ones that are least grateful. The outsiders who don't come to church, they are more thankful. Why? Because the children of God take God for granted. Hmm? Those outside are more grateful to God. They appreciate God more. So he was a Samaritan. Just said, well, there are not ten tribes for where the man is. So today, wherever you are, in fact, he said, arise. They are not found that return to give glory to God. Save the stranger. And he said unto him, arise, go thy way, that faith had made thee whole. That faith had made thee whole. It was that man's faith that brought him back to Jesus. Matthew 9, 22. Matthew 9, Mark 5, 34. Your faith has made you whole. Go on. Matthew 9, 22. Yes. He just turned around and when he saw her, he said, Daughter, be encouraged. Yes. Your faith has made you well. And the woman was healed at that moment. That is it. Your faith will make you whole. So, as I said earlier, if you're listening to this message, wherever you may be, Jesus is passing by and he's talking to you. Are you going to receive him? Or are you going to lose the opportunity and say, oh, well, next time? No, there may not be any next time. This is the last day of the year. You need to make a commitment right now. You need to surrender to him right now. You need to bless his name right now. There may not be another moment. Like those ten lepers, they seized on the opportunity. Suppose they had said, oh, we don't even know whether what I said about this man is true. Or, why do you have to bother? He won't look at us anyway. They're lepers. I mean, nobody talks to us. So why should he talk to us? Why should we bother? They would have missed the opportunity of a lifetime because leprosy is incurable. But by going to Jesus, they received healing. Something that money could not buy. Today, Jesus is passing by. Money. Your money cannot buy your salvation. You may be the richest man. Jeff Bezos is the richest man on this earth. He's worth over $60 billion. His money cannot get him into the kingdom of heaven. But Jesus is asking you today. He's offering you a free gift which your money can buy. He's already done the work. All you have to do is just accept the gift. You're ready and you're prepared. Let us pray. Say, Lord Jesus, I've sinned against God and man. I'm not worthy to be called a son or daughter. Have mercy and forgive me my sins today. Wash my sins away with the precious blood and come inside my heart and begin to roll and reign over my life. Now take my name from the book of the dead, those destined for hellfire and take and put my name in the book of life. That from this point on, I promise to serve you in holiness and truth to obey your commandments and to receive your mercy. Thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 That simple prayer, you said it from the bottom of your heart, wherever you may be. Like those lepers, you will receive a gift that money cannot buy. You will receive healing that no doctor can give you the healing of your soul. You will receive membership in those going to the kingdom of heaven. So seize the opportunity, take it as you enter the new year. The Lord will be with you and guide you every day of your life. Let us pray. Jehovah, Jesus Christ, holy Michael. The King of kings and the Lord of lords. 
the God of the world. We thank you for the word shared in our hearts today. Let this word sink deep into our spirits. Give us a revelation of your loving kindness and your mercy. Especially to those that fear you and keep your commandments. As we enter the new year, give us the spirit and the power to obey your commandments. Father, give us the free gift of salvation. Have mercy upon us today, Father. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen, amen, amen. That's it. Let's read this passage again. Meditate on this. And the Lord will minister by his Holy Spirit. Jesus name. Amen. Oh,